Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second half of today's proceedings. It's uh, now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen McInerney. Stephen is Senior Lecturer in Literature and Associate Dean of Studies at Campion College. He holds a doctorate from the University of Sydney and a Bachelor of Arts with First Class Honours from the Australian National University, where he was awarded the University Medal in English in 2000. In 2012, he completed an advanced diploma in Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Cambridge, completing a dissertation on John Henry Newman and the Liturgy, and was awarded the Theological Studies Prize and the Lightfoot Prize. His scholarly monograph, The Enclosure of an Open Mystery, a study of the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins, David Jones and Les Murray, was published by Peter Lang in 2012. A published poet himself, his first book was recommended by Les Murray in the Times Literary Supplement Books of the Year, and a new volume, The Wind Outside, is due for publication next February. Um, in addition to writing poetry, Stephen's also an excellent uh, public reader of poetry, particularly his own, and it was a great pleasure as a student to listen to his recitations. So without further ado, Stephen McInerney on Newman and the Catholic University of Ireland. Thank you, Simon. Simon may have given the impression there that I used to inflict my own poems on students, <laughs> but that was not the case. <laughs> the controversies in education, it was said by uh, John Senior uh, in his work, uh, The Restoration of Christian Culture, are sometimes really uh, conflicts in theology. That is, conflicts or disputes about the most fundamental questions of human existence, and man's relationship with the divine. John Henry Newman's idea of a university, perhaps the most famous and influential defence of liberal education ever written, arose from just such a dispute. In 1845, the year Newman was received into the Catholic Church, the Queen's College's Ireland Act was passed to enable, as the subheading of the Act states, her Majesty to endow new colleges for the advancement in learning in Ireland. This led eventually, in 1850, to the establishment of the Queen's University of Ireland. The move was promoted by Sir Robert Peel, a British Conservative politician and twice Prime Minister, with the intention of opening up university education in Ireland to non-Anglicans or non-Church of Ireland members, including Roman Catholics, who, though able to matriculate, were ineligible to take degrees from Trinity College Dublin, Ireland's oldest and most prestigious university, because of the religious tests enforced there. Tests which, like those of Oxford and Cambridge in England, required students to assent to the Articles of Anglicanism. Unlike Trinity College, the Queen's colleges were to be non-denominational, open to Anglicans, Roman Catholics, non-conformists, and at least theoretically, non-believers alike. Peel, who had been a foe of John Henry Newman's during the latter's Anglican years, was a generous man who promoted the kind of liberalism that Newman detested. Peel's address on the opening of the Tamworth Reading Room in 1841 had elicited from the Anglican Newman a searing, though anonymous, series of letters to the Times in which Newman challenged what he described as Peel's contention that the sciences and humane letters represented a kind of neutral ground on which men of every shade of politics and religion may meet together, disabuse each other of their prejudices, form intimacies and secure cooperation. As outlined in his speech on that occasion, Peel noted that works of controversial divinity, which divided rather than united men of goodwill, he argued, were to be excluded from the Tamworth reading room. Newman, of course, would have none of it, and he deplored the idea that religious texts should be vigorously excluded while sciences and humane letters should be promoted in their stead as the source 
of moral good. Newman saw no essential conflict between religion and science, and as a great controversialist himself in religious matters, certainly saw the pursuit of truth as more important than a quiet peace based on ignoring the elephant in the room, the differences between men on matters that touched on their eternal destinies. It was just the sort of liberalism that had inspired Peel's promotion of the Queen's Colleges that was evident four years earlier in his speech at the opening of the Tamworth Reading Room. And his promotion of the Queen's Colleges elicited a similar reaction from the majority, though not all, of the Catholic hierarchy as his speech for the opening of the Tamworth Reading Room had drawn from Newman. On the face of it, one might imagine that a development like the Queen's Colleges would have been welcomed by the authorities of the Catholic Church. After all, they were to be the beneficiaries of Peel's liberalism. Here was an opportunity for Catholic men, hitherto deprived of the ordinary pathway to social advancement, to take their place among their non-Catholic peers at the forefront of Irish society, affecting the kind of social mobility that Catholics today in the developed world take for granted. Apart from a small minority of Irish bishops, however, the church authorities were unenthusiastic, fearful rather than excited by the prospect of their faithful getting embroiled in what was then called mixed education. The Irish hierarchy nevertheless recognised the need to respond to the challenges that the Queen's Colleges were endeavouring to meet, and to the challenge posed to Catholic consciences by the emergence of the Queen's Colleges themselves. Could Catholics attend? The hierarchy's answer following Rome's lead was no, although Archbishop Murray of Dublin had favoured the idea. It would be one thing, however, to forbid Catholics to take the opportunity to attend the Queen's Colleges. It would be quite another not to provide a legitimate Catholic alternative. In the same year that the Queen's University of Ireland opened its doors, therefore, the Catholic Church in Ireland, with the endorsement of Pope Pius IX, established the Catholic University Committee under the leadership of Archbishop Paul Cullen, the future Cardinal, with the aim of establishing a Catholic university in Ireland. A year later, a letter from Cullen arrived on the desk of one Father John Henry Newman, England's most famous convert at his oratory in Birmingham. Cullen invited Newman to deliver some lectures in Dublin on education in the coming year and to advise him on staff appointments. By the end of the year, Newman had been made president of the future Catholic University of Ireland. He once joked that um, as president, he would also make himself dean and the entire faculty. <laughs> Newman would hold this position as president for seven turbulent years. He began to prepare his lectures and the idea of a university was born. Once again, as he had done in his first battle with Peel, on this occasion he was not directly battling with Peel, he would argue strongly against the idea of there being a strictly neutral ground in education. And here, the thought of G.K. Chesterton aligns with that of John Henry Newman. In The Common Man, Chesterton wrote, every education touches philosophy, if not by dogma, then by suggestion, by implication, by atmosphere. Every part of that education has a connection with every other part. If it does not all combine to convey some general view of life, it is not an education at all. Where Peel had argued that the controversial divinity, controversial works of theology in other words, should be excluded from the reading room, Newman, by contrast, saw theology as the very integrating principle of the university and believed that in its absence, an educational institution, including a university, would find some other 
thing to integrate the curriculum. In other words, some other philosophy, as Chesterton describes it, which if not by dogma, then by suggestion, by implication, by atmosphere, will colour the whole enterprise. By the time Cullen's letter arrived for Newman in April 1851, its recipient had been a Catholic for just over five years and a Catholic priest uh, for only a little over three. But Newman was still in some ways an obvious choice as the university's first president. Although he did not yet exert the influence over the British Catholic imagination that he would come to exert, after the publication of his Apologia in 1864, he was nonetheless easily the best qualified English Catholic priest to run the university. And there was no question, of course, at that time, other than that the president had to be a priest. Newman had been, as an Anglican, the most famous man at Oxford from the time he became a fellow at Oriel College in 1822 until his conversion to Roman Catholicism in 1845. He, along with John Keeble and Edward Pusey, spearheaded the Oxford Movement, which transformed the Church of England and recalled it to its vocation, as Newman and the other Tractarians understood it, as part of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, not only the Church of England, but the Church in England, Catholic and Reformed at once, a via media, in Newman's phrase, between the excesses of Roman Catholicism on the one hand evangelical Protestantism on the other. Eric alluded uh, to this idea uh, that the Church of England saw itself as part of the Catholic Church in his talk on Manning. Through a series of tracts, Newman, Pusey, Keeble and others, Manning contributed some tracts later on, argued for the apostolicity of the Church of England. They encouraged regular attendance at the service of Holy Communion, fostering in doing so a liturgical revival in Anglicanism, and saw themselves as continuing the ethos and the ambience of the Church of the Fathers, which was a phrase that Newman loved. By the mid-1830s, the Church of England was effectively divided three ways between the older High Churchmen, Evangelicals, and this new breed of Anglo-Catholics. <coughs> who were variously described as Tractarians, Fuseyites, and Newmanites. And the Tractarians were at once more conservative than the older high churchmen in some respects, and more radical in others than the evangelicals. The Oxford movement railed against liberalising laws that allowed Roman Catholics and nonconformists to assume positions of authority in the English Parliament and therefore positions of influence over the Church of England. Again, something that uh, Garrick alluded to in terms of the influence over the Church of England of the English state. And they argued against liberalising tendencies at Oxford itself, not infrequently challenging the orthodoxy of their peers, calling for books to be investigated for doctrinal rectitude, and insisting on the necessity of assent to the articles of the Anglican religion, as a necessary prerequisite to matriculate uh, to the university. Catholics could matriculate at Cambridge but not take a degree, but at Oxford they couldn't even matriculate at this time. Yet the Oxford movement also redefined in time what assent to the articles of religion meant. And in turn, they themselves became the subject of investigation and censure by the university authorities. Newman came to argue 1841 in Tract 90, that one could interpret the Articles of Religion in a way that allowed one to accept many of the tenets of Roman Catholicism. Through all of this, the imaginations of the young in Oxford were stirred. Hundreds flocked to hear Newman preach at the University Church each week, where he was vicar from 1828 to 1843. He exerted an incredible influence on young men, many of whom becoming impatient with the Church of England's middle or muddled way, as they saw it, preceded Newman into the Catholic Church, exceeding him in impatience, just as, in Newman's view, they exceeded him in imprudence. By 1843, Newman and a group of these young men had retired to the parish church of Littlemore, 
where together they lived a quasi-monastic life, celebrated the Eucharist daily, an unusual practice in Anglicanism at the time, and even recited the Roman Catholic breviary with minor changes rather than the established Book of Common Prayer. Yet none of this might have happened were it not for an earlier conflict Newman embroiled himself in at Oriel College years before. Newman had noticed that many of the college's students hired private tutors to prepare for their university exams. This seemed to him to point to deficiencies in the way the tutorial system was run at his college and indeed at the Oxford colleges more generally. Why, if the colleges were meeting the students' academic needs, would the students need to pay for additional private tuition? Newman believed the tutor's role had been gradually whittled away over the course of centuries. Ideally for Newman, the tutor was supposed to be a guide in life, not only in studies, in morals and attitudes, not only in discipline. The tutor ought to model for his students the life of the gentleman, and more than this, the life of the Christian gentleman. His role ought to be pastoral as well as academic. He should therefore have more involvement in his students' day-to-day -day lives, advising them on their lecture programs and their subjects, and teaching him himself, teaching them himself whenever possible. Instead of this ideal, the tutors had become by Newman's time mere disciplinarians at worst, at worst, or distant dons at best unconcerned with the inner lives of their students. Newman had some support for his suggested changes, but not the support of the man who most mattered, the college's provost, Edward Hawkins. Eventually, although Newman's experimental system was attempted, Hawkins insisted that if Newman did not return to the previous system, he would simply not send him any more students, which is in fact what happened. Newman, whose reforms were inspired by his belief that tutors needed to be more engaged with their students, ended up having no formal teaching duties at all. Although as a fellow of the college, he retained all the privileges of his fellowship, room, board and income. Newman thus had time on his hands and he used it to throw himself into ever greater um, contra uh, controversies from which the Oxford movement was born. The Oriel experiment teaches us two important lessons about Newman, which shed light on his future as the president of the Catholic University of Ireland and on his idea of the university. The first is that Newman thought deeply about what education actually meant. He was not content simply to ride the wave of privilege at Oriel. He believed a tutor was in a real sense a cure of souls serving his students in a manner consistent with his vocation as an Anglican priest. And he wanted to situate this role within the larger idea and purpose of a university. It was essentially a medieval view, one that reached back for its inspiration to the time of Oxford's foundation in the 12th century. What, after all, were these young men at Oxford for? Were they there simply to hobnob with their peers in the English aristocracy, or increasingly, their peers in the emerging English middle class? Or was there more to it? Something that touched upon the very meaning of civilization and indeed of life itself. Why, Newman queried, do we insist on our students learning the classics and studying theology? How does what they do in the university relate to life beyond the university? Newman would come to address such questions in response to Archbishop Cullen's request. The second lesson from the Oriel episode, and one evident throughout Newman's subsequent time in the Oxford movement, is that Newman was willing to engage in religious disputes in order to articulate, not just religious disputes, but disputes, in order to articulate, refine and defend his own ideas. He always demurred at the idea of himself as a theologian, preferring to style himself as a controversialist. And whether at Oriel as an Anglican, or in Birmingham and Dublin as a Catholic, controversy always seemed to find him. And Newman 
always seem to discover his best and worst selves in times of such controversy. His role as president of the Catholic University of Ireland would prove no different. He would have run-ins with Cullen just as he had with Hawkins at Oriel, and he would need to understand and account for all the competing views in play about just what a university was for, and to do so in a relatively alien context, Catholic Ireland, as far from Oxford intellectually and socially at that time as could be imagined, as Jared Manley Hopkins would discover many decades later. Newman relished the idea that in spearheading a university in Ireland, the battle there, he said, will be what it was in Oxford 20 years ago. And one can sense in those words a kind of um, nostalgia for his previous time at Oxford, which he hoped to, as it were, revive now as a Catholic in a new setting. Newman, though, did perhaps not anticipate that he would be embroiled in battles with fellow Catholics, though this too was to prove um, a real feature of his life. Garrick alluded to some of Cardinal Manning's enemies in the church. Um, it might be overstating it to say that Newman was an enemy of, of Manning, but certainly uh, their relationship was very uneasy. <coughs> One such dispute arose with Cullen over Newman's geographical distance from the university. Newman had always insisted in his dealings with Cullen that in taking on presidency of the new university, he would still need to devote the majority of his time and energy to his role as superior of the Birmingham Oratory. For their part, Newman's fellow oratorians were of the view that only the highest position in the university could justify Newman's involvement in it in the first place, not realising perhaps that such would necessitate Newman being um, absent for greater periods from the community than was desirable. So Newman was caught between the hopes of his community and those of Cullen. Cullen seemed to understand at first, but he never quite got used to the idea of an absentee president one who would quite literally sail in and out of Ireland a few times. Newman News perhaps one day would establish an oratory in Dublin near the university, which could serve, in effect, as a chaplain's But this eventuate. His desire to do this shows again this constant theme in his biography, this constant search for, for integration. Um, between his, his vocation as a priest and his, um, his other vocation, related vocation, as a teacher. Uh, but his attempts really to involve himself in higher education as a Catholic were consistently frustrated. I'll say more about that um, towards the end of the, the lecture. I have said that Newman was in many ways the best candidate as the university's founding president, but in some respects he was still not particularly well suited to the role. For one thing, and, and most obviously, he was an Englishman with a limited, a very limited interest in Irish affairs and even less understanding of them. He was seriously lacking in uh, sens the sensitivities needed to understand the Irish predicament these were needed to ensure that the university, the Catholic University of Ireland, would be more than simply a transplanted English university in Ireland. For a start, it didn't occur to Newman that Irish culture was itself distinctive with its own language, which had only recently been suppressed. But then it hadn't seemed to occur to Irish churchmen either, whether Church of Ireland or Catholic, who seemed to have been characterised by their strange, a strange combination of slavishness to English ways and resentment of their cultural enslavement, especially obviously in the case of Catholics, that is a sad part of the story of 19th century Ireland. Newman, however, did have the foresight to insist that wherever possible, Irish nationals should be appointed to key posts. 
But again, he seems not to have recognised the contradiction that these same Irishmen, especially those teaching history and literature, would be expected to be immersed not in distinctively Irish culture, but in British and more specifically English culture. His view that the university would straightforwardly represent the importation of Oxford into Ireland is telling. The Australian poet Les Murray writes that in post-World War II Australia, a major in English at university, a major in English made one a minor Englishman. And much the same was true of 19th century Ireland. Newman was still relatively new as a Catholic as well, and had hardly come to terms with the full implications of the cultural and religious shift he had made and what it meant for his life by the time Cullen's letter arrived on his desk. The next decade in Newman's life would bring it home to him all too well um, how uh, difficult that transition would prove to be. One episode recounted by Ian, Father Ian Carr in his biography of Newman points symbolically to another problem that Newman faced. Arriving in Dublin in February of 1854 to start, at last, the Catholic University of Ireland, Newman climbed into a cab at Kilkenny Station and asked to be taken to the bishop's residence. The cabman promptly agreed, but instead of taking Newman to Cullen's address, he took him instead to the residence of the Church of Ireland bishop, that Protestant bishop, as Newman called him. Newman had evidently been mistaken for an Anglican or Church of Ireland clergyman. He was, by Catholic standards, very new to the church. The oil of ordination was less than a few years dry on his hands, and he was apparently wearing the type of shirt commonly seen on Anglican clergymen. This would have only been evident, presumably, under his cassock. The type of shirt commonly seen on Anglican clergymen, but not on Catholic priests. If a typical Irish caddy mistook Newman for a Protestant clergyman, what would others make of this strange creature from across the waters who spoke with an upper middle class English accent, had attended Oxford, studied in Rome, and who it seems likely would never have visited Ireland were it not for Cullen's letter? What then of the Catholic University of Ireland? Perhaps predictably, it failed. Newman left in 18. 57, frustrated by his lack of progress and by the difficulties of the commute. 20 <coughs> years later, it enrolled only three students. The Jesuits assumed control of it under its new name, University College Dublin, and one of their most famous members, at least someone who's become famous, he wasn't at the time, the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, who had been received into the church by Newman and was once employed by Newman at the Birmingham Oratory School, lived and taught Greek at the university for five years before his death. It was the unhappiest period of Hopkins' life, but we owe to it the so-called terrible sonnets, which are among the great poems in the language. By 1909, the university was absorbed by the National University of Ireland. Cullen's dream had come to an end. Newman's, though, lives on in the idea of a university, which has, as Frank Turner has argued, exerted extraordinary influence over the discussion and conceptualisation of higher education, especially in the 20th century. But Newman's attempt to be involved in Catholic higher education uh, was not finished. He had harboured hopes, just as he wanted to establish an oratory in Dublin to be near the university, so he harboured more um, problematic hopes of starting an oratory in Oxford to be near to the university there. Newman had initially feared this development when he was president of the Catholic University of Ireland. Feared, that is, that on the one hand Catholics would be readmitted to Oxford and on the other that the Catholic hierarchy might actually allow that to happen. Newman feared it because he thought that this would present um, competition to the Catholic University of Ireland, which it would not be able to, to um, combat. Newman, in principle, 
in the 1850s remained opposed to mixed education, just like the Pope. But as he searched his heart, he recognised that he himself desired to return to the city of the Dreaming Spires, where he had felt so at home for so many years prior to his conversion to the Catholic Church. Indeed, in 1860, only two years after resigning the rectorship of the Catholic University of Ireland, he purchased property, I'm sorry, I've got the dates wrong. In 1860, he began to prepare for the possibility that they would be re that Catholics would be readmitted to Oxford, and in 1864, he purchased, with his own money, um, grounds in Oxford, or land in Oxford, on which he hoped to build a college and a church, fully expecting that Catholics would be readmitted to study with their Protestant peers and that the Catholic hierarchy, notwithstanding all the evidence to the contrary, would acquiesce in this. Newman was now in favour of mixed education, at least where Oxford was concerned. Bishop Ullathorne harboured the desire to build a Catholic church in Oxford, and from the outset, Newman wanted to be, and Ullathorne wanted him to be, involved in the project. Rome gave, in principle, support to the establishment of a Catholic mission in Oxford, but ordered Newman, who had started to raise funds for the project, to cease his involvement in it. By this time, Newman was out of favour in Rome. He was seen as an ally of liberal Catholics, including Dollinger and Lord Acton, and his own writings, including on consulting the faithful on matters of doctrine, his criticisms in the apologia of what he called an extreme ultra-party in the church, um, which many, in which many believed he numbered many, and his views on the temporal powers of the Pope, made him a deeply suspect figure in the eyes of many Catholics, or many significant Catholics in England, and indeed in, in Rome. This was complicated, of course, by the fame that ensued in the wake of the publication of his Apologia. But of course, all of this was far in the future when Newman was the president of the Catholic University of Ireland. Now, what is the legacy of this seemingly failed experiment to establish a Catholic university in Ireland? Well, of course, the most tangible fruit is the work, the idea of a university, um, comprised of the lectures, of course, subsequently edited, but comprised of the lectures that Newman delivered, uh, both in anticipation of the university's opening uh, and subsequent to its opening. Twelve months ago, as I was driving home from, from college, uh, I listened to the radio as a university professor spoke about the need for students to encounter what he called big history, a discipline, he argued, that helps students see the fundamental connectedness of things and to ask the big questions. What does it all mean? How does it all fit together? I thought to myself, on the surface, this is pure Newman, who was asking and answering the same questions 150 years ago, who believed a university was precisely that place where students could pursue what he called universal knowledge, including theology, and where the disciplines could converse with one another, as those that undertook them sought to become gentlemen, and where, in a Catholic university, those same gentlemen could advance also in their true vocation to be saints. But Newman's idea of a university is far from being a pious or even strictly speaking a religious work. With the notable exception of the encomium of the papacy in the opening chapter. And a university is not, as Newman made clear, a seminary. Nor is it a place primarily designed to prepare people for the professions, Newman thought. It is ironic, therefore, given that Newman is the most articulate advocate for the notion of the wonderful uselessness of the liberal arts, useless insofar as they are studied for their own sake, that the most successful part of the Catholic University in Ireland was its medical school. Newman, though, was not opposed to practical subjects being studied at university, 
and he came to appreciate, notwithstanding his own ideals, that the university did need to prepare its largely middle-class students to enter professions. But this, for Newman, was always a secondary aim. The real purpose of the university is to create an environment where men, he says, though they cannot pursue every subject which is open to them, will be the gainers by living among those and under those who represent the whole circle, where a group of learned men, zealous for their own sciences and rivals of each other, are brought by familiar intercourse and for the sake of intellectual peace to adjust the claims and relations of their respective subjects of investigation. The special fruit of the education furnished at the university, according to Newman, is a certain habit of mind, which lasts through life, of which the attributes are freedom, equitableness, calmness, moderation, and wisdom, or what I have ventured to call, he concludes, a philosophical habit. So as a country, as we continue to debate the role of universities in a changing global context, in the world and in the church, we could do worse and turn to Newman as our guide. After all, the attributes of the philosophical habit he describes, freedom, equitableness, calmness, moderation and wisdom, are the very ones needed to ensure that such debates are fruitful. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for a most fascinating lecture talking about Newman's role with universities. Um, just a more lightweight question for me to start off Good. with. <laughs> what do you think Newman would have made of Evelyn Waugh's depiction of Oxford in Brightside Revisited? Because you've then got this other great <laughs> English Catholic convert, and it's one of the most <laughs> known depictions of a Catholic approach to Oxford. Yeah. But it's Newman's name is mentioned in the novel. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Newman's name is mentioned in the novel, I think. Um, well, he would have, of course, what part of what was evoking is the, the beauty of the, the architecture um, as well as the, the wonderful idea of, of all these people coming together to study and, and so on. And, but I think Newman would have identified what I think War himself identified as, as a degree of decadence um, in the description of you know, the lives of Sebastian and Charles. And probably, I don't know, he, maybe he, he um, would have been more lighthearted about it, but probably he would have thought that um, you know, Oxford had gone the way of all flesh. I'm guessing. I, I, I don't think he... I mean, he ultimately, of course, he didn't believe that... Um, uh, it could um, achieve its ends because it was not under the um, under the, the banner of the Holy See and it was not um, Catholic. So ultimately, he didn't believe it would achieve its ends. But he he's usually more circumspect and um, hesitant in his letters. So when he was thinking of going to um, Oxford under um, after Ullathorne had suggested it, he wrote to Edward Pusey and uh, he assured Pusey, um, and maybe Newman had to spend time in purgatory because of this after what Garrick said, but he assured Pusey that um, you know, he would not and, um, represent an opposition to what Pusey and, and the Oxford movement were, by that time, many years after Newman had left it, were trying to achieve and that they were not going there to, to antagonise Anglicans, um, not only antagonise, but even to, to represent a kind of um, public alternative. Uh, now, he may have just been polite in saying that, but, um, yeah, he, he wasn't as, I don't think, um, adamant about um, the limitations of Anglicanism in private as he was in, in public. Oh, sorry, I'll let... I'll let Simeon decide. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, what I was wondering, um, you've discussed Newman's ideals of virtue and virtue. But what I'm curious to know is, can you give us a grasp of the Catholic system? Um, can it, as it is, become that which is offensive to the extreme of the Catholic sense? Okay. Uh, 
Well, Newman, of course, um, established a school, a high school. Well, it was a, what age is doing that? It's long gone. I think it ran from junior school to high school in Birmingham, the Birmingham Oratory School, um, which was um, a, a great school. Um, but can the ideals in the idea of the university be exactly like Bobby? I mean, analogously, they can. In so far as Newman, as like the church, believes that Catholic education is the ideal, but of course that that means that religion has a prominent place in the school, um, and that the subjects. And this goes back to something else that Garrick mentioned. You know, I've heard this from a number of people, uh, even within Catholic schools here. You know, in in the um, time when Catholic schools were actually primarily doing their job. Um, that there were all sorts of um, undercurrents that were probably um, working against it. So studying essentially history as it was as it was um, outlined to be studied by whatever the Board of Studies was called back then meant studying a, a version essentially of, of Protestant history, a Protestant version of history. So even within um, um, really good Catholic schools and by standards, by comparison with today, the Catholic schools back then were very good, I'm led to believe. Um, there are still challenges, and I don't know exactly the detail of the curriculum of the Birmingham Oratory School. It would have been very simple. It would have been um, the trivium. It would have been logic, grammar, and rhetoric, um, plus some, some um, I'm guessing, some history and some mathematics and maybe some, some natural sciences. Uh, Newman wasn't just interested, though, in, in the details of curriculum, but in also in the pastoral side. So he was he came into conflict with some of the other oratorians because he wanted a um, uh, a woman to work for the school. He wanted a, a nurse who would who would not just be um, someone that the, the boys would go to when they were sick and so on, but would be a motherly presence in the college. He thought it was essential. That young boys had a mother who were away from their parents because they were boarding had a motherly presence in the uh, in the school. So he he has um, you know great insights I think Newman into um, human psychology. Not that he ever formally wrote it. Well, I guess he did in the grammar of dissent. But um, now applying it to today, I think um, generally speaking, you can look to Newman insofar as Newman advocated the the centrality of the classical education. Uh, so, you know, training students in, in uh, grammar, logic and rhetoric. But before that, you know, in, um, in poetic knowledge, you know, in wonder. Um, Gregory of Nyssa said, only wonder understands. And um, Newman had, had the same idea. So, um, you know, the poetry of education was important for Newman. Um, the specific stuff he's talking about in the idea of a university is is often about, you know, the, in the case of literature, the canon of English literature, the problem of studying a literature that's primarily been produced by Protestants rather than Catholics. Um, what, how is a Catholic supposed to approach someone like Dickens or whoever? I mean, it wasn't Dickens he mentioned, but someone like Walter Scott who he really loved. Um, and I guess, I guess these things can be applied down through the levels, secondary school and primary school as well. There's another one. Yeah. Uh, in, in view of your work on um, Newman and the liturgy, what would be your... Uh, how do you think he would have reacted to the major concilia document, a sacrosanctum concilium, and more particularly the way it was implemented somewhat it wasn't really the way the council fathers voted on that do you think for example something like the latin mass society would have had him as a patron do you think he would have uh, steered clear of oh look i mean it's hard to sort of try and take him out of the 19th century and stick him into the 1960s uh, but i think being um perceptive man, that he would have thought the, the conciliar document was highly ambiguous in some respects. 
and problematic, um, and that certainly its implementation was um, seriously problematic. Uh, and he would have, um, I mean, you know, whether he, you know, I, I don't know about um, you know, trying to, as I say, take him from them, put him today, but um, I think he would have thought the whole thing was a disaster, to be honest. He would have thought the whole thing was a disaster. He would have agreed, he would have agreed with, Garrick mentioned Cardinal Ottaviani, he would have agreed with, I think, what Cardinal Ottaviani said. intervention. But, but, um, the, the, the counter to this, not, doesn't necessarily negate, but doesn't negate what I'm saying, but I think what he would have recognised too was that the problems didn't all emerge from um, the council. Uh, and that, you know, of course, things that happened in the Oxford movement after Newman left it, um, the revival of, of uh, you know, cor the Coral Office, for example, um, especially Evensong, um, the, the sort of liturgical movement in the Church of England, which was running alongside the, the 19th century liturgical movement in Catholicism, you know, led by uh, Jean Paul de Goranger and Salem and the, the revival of Gregorian chant. Newman, um, you know, I suspect, had he been in a different setting, um, would have welcomed that becoming the norm, um, would have welcomed a sun liturgy as the norm, um, would have welcomed a number of aspects of um, the 20th century liturgical movement, Pius X's advocation of frequent communion and so on. Um, some of these ideas, um, you know, you could argue couldn't have happened or been implemented other than for something as, as um, dramatic as the council. But um, I, I don't think he would have approved of what you get in the average Catholic parish. I think, he, I mean, I think it's just obvious that he would have been appalled. I think just reading him on the liturgy, it's just obvious that he would have been appalled. Um, the intricacies about how to solve it, exactly why we got to this point and so on, you know, I'm not, I can't exactly say what his answers were. In the paper that I've written on it, I take passages from his sermons as an Anglican, um, you know, where he shows great awareness of the importance of what we do with our bodies, what we do with our, our words and so on, uh, the gestures of liturgy, the importance of ritual. Though he wasn't a ritualist, which was a, a sort of strand of the Oxford movement that took place, that developed after he'd left it. Um, but, but he was very conscious of, you know, what it meant if you changed things in the liturgy. You know, he, he reacted very, a number of the early tracks are about this you know, on not changing the liturgy. Now, he's talking about the Book of Common Prayer um, and what this will do, he says, to the faith of the masses if you go around changing things that, that have been, um, you know, made sacral by time. The fact was, that we worship as our parents worship and as our grandparents worship, that was very important to him. He was immensely good on reverence. Wasn't yes, he was. Which you see in his uh, uh, sermons as an Anglican. That's right. And his virtuoso performances. Yes. Yes. And, you know, everybody was meant to bow down and worship. That's right. And, and when he talks about approaching, you know, he's writing this as an Anglican, of going forward to receive the communion, what we do with our bodies, and so on. I mean, you just see this tremendous awareness of the, the importance of, of detail and the way that um, praxis and um, doctrine, you know, work together. You know, the lex orandi, lex credendi, that yeah. principle. Well, without spending too much time in hijacking it, it seems to me that the more that the Australian Catholic Bishop Conference tries to, or wants to be seen to be simplifying things to perhaps make it more attractive by eliminating genuflection and kneeling and uh, yeah. uh, eliminating the uh, Friday accidents and fast and, and look, you know, the number of holy days of obligation. Well, I might. It's, I mean, they're counterproductive. Yeah. Seems to well, me. I think they're more than counterproductive. I mean, Newman, without exaggerating, would have seen these things as indicative of a growing apostasy. Mm -hmm. 
and that's he would have. I mean, um, now that's a different question from what he would have made of, you know, the concilium document on the liturgy. Um, but you know, where we are now, I think it's beyond doubt. What he would have um, it's not. It's not clear how he would have acted, though. That's why I'm, I'm you know, hedging a bit. It's just not clear. We can't say how he would have reacted. And yet, other than the uh, biannual publication of the priest, I don't see his, his thinking anywhere else in the Catholic community. Yeah, the, the sentence. No, well, I mean, for the reasons that, for the reasons that Garrick has yeah. outlined. Um, Dr. Tan. It's always a grenade when this subject comes up. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That's a good question. Well, only in so far as he, and in this he was a little bit prosaic. Only in so far as he saw, you know, he was a lot of emphasis on the, the didactic value. The didactic role of of the liturgy, um, and when he's, I mean, it's true, uh, but it, it comes across as a little as a little prosaic. Um, but on the liturgy in an educational context, is that what you mean? Yeah, a more like any explicit statement that can't be said on dissociation. Or dissociation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. uh, well, only a very obvious one for him, which is that a. Catholic university, and you're obviously, you know, the, the sacraments are readily available, the liturgy is celebrated regularly, and so on. But beyond that, um, no. Yeah. I know I've, ups I've upset you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't upset me at all. I agree. Everything you said about the liturgy and the um except the nature of Octaviani, mm. uh, of whom I have a personal recollection, yes. because I had quite a lot to do with him. Yes. And I, I won't say what I speak No, I understand. I was referring specifically to his um, intervention, intervention yes. on, the, on the canon of the Mass. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm. But I understand that, um, um, from my reading, that he probably was not the kind of person that Newman would have liked to deal with. He certainly was not. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. No, I, I had a one-hour conversation yeah. that I remember, uh, and he wasn't talking down to me in any way. Yes. It was a war factor. Is that right? But uh, 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 what he was trying to do and get out of me yeah. stuff that was, for him, politically, yeah. about the college I was in. Yes. Well, like so much of it goes on in the day. Yes. Uh, very underhand. Yeah. You, look, Newman, Newman to me is the most interesting figure of almost in the entire 19th century, but one of the ways he's really interesting is that for someone who had such great love for the office of the Pope um, and, of course, for the, for the truth of the Church, yet felt that the way that that office was exercised in his time was um, uh, over the top. He thought that it represented actually the, the um, kind of bringing around both those he called the ultra party ward and, and um, Talbot, who of course called Newman the most dangerous man in England. Um, that uh, that this was really not only problematic but a risk for the church, uh, and that it, it would um, of course not a fundamental one in the sense that it wouldn't make the church cease to be the church, but prevent the church being all it could be in a particular time and place, um, which was, that explains in part why he was uh, not in favour before the First Vatican Council of the definition of, was not in favour of dogmatising papal infallibility, although of course he accepted it once it had been. Um, and he didn't like the way the Holy Office worked, and he didn't like the spy agencies among Recent converts in England who were try who were delete uh, delating him to Rome, and it was all very un unpleasant and and unsavoury. Yeah. Well, one thing that can Sorry, be said, yeah. uh, if I may, uh, about Newman is that he would have loved this church. Oh, that's very kind. Uh, uh, no, no, I really think. Uh, that. 
<laughs> Richard said that Newman would have loved this place. Okay. Newman said that Newman, uh, sorry, Richard said that Richard Connolly said that Newman would have loved this place, mm. which is a great compliment. And staff of Salmon, if I can just cut in because we're almost out of time. <laughs> situated between Derrick Richards Corning and Eden Road and the uh, and the uh, and the bench course of Derrick Richards Corning. But quite honestly, if you had succeeded in Ireland, wouldn't that not have made a difference to the way in which Anglican Irish Catholicism developed up to the present time? I mean the fact that the, the whole thing failed and then Subsumed into a state organized uh, university in Canada. If he succeeded, would we not have seen a different kind of Irish Catholicism develop over that? And if so, which would have led you to have a different situation with the Irish Church in Ireland? I think so. Yeah. Um, but I think what prevented it from succeeding is precisely uh, what explains the situation today. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stephen, again.